Uh, we're going to look at uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 through 19. You got it, buddy? Is it uh, not going? No, oh, there we go. All right. Um, so just as a review, last week we ended off with the idea, and you can go to the next slide there, buddy. We, le went off, we left off with the idea that Melchizedek, um, who is a type of Christ or a, an example of Christ, uh, is greater than Abraham. That's pretty much the entire point of verses 1 through 10. And that takes us into uh, verse 11 through 19. So uh, for this part, buddy, um, I'm going to raise my hand every time for you to go to the next one, okay? Because you're going to have to go through. Can somebody read uh, these verses? Uh, 11 through 19. Now, if perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to appear, said to be according to to the order of Melchizedek, and not according to the order of Aaron. For when there is a change of the priesthood, there must be a change of law as well. For the one, for the one these things are spoken about, belonged to a different tribe. No one from it has served at the altar. Now it is evident that our Lord came from Judah, and Moses said nothing about that tribe concerning priests. And this becomes clearer if another priest like Melchizedek appears who did not become a priest based on a legal regulation about physical descent, but based on the power of an indestructible life. For it has been testified, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So the previous command is annulled because it was weak and unprofitable, for the law perfected nothing. But a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. Okay, so those are the verses that we're looking at. Um, let's answer a couple questions before we get into the verse-by-verse -verse bit. The first off, and we asked this question months ago, um, we asked, who is Melchizedek, and what does it mean for it to be the order of, uh, order of Melchizedek? What is, what's going on there? Well, we already looked to answer the question of who Melchizedek was. We, we looked at that last week. But now let's kind of build on that idea of what is the order of Melchizedek? So sometimes I think we read something, and we kind of lose sight of the forest for the trees, and we kind of make it too complicated. So it's not that Jesus is actually a part of some elite transcendent club, right? There's like this, this otherworldly order, you know, and Jesus was welcomed into the ranks, like Melchizedek was welcomed into the ranks. That's not the idea that's happening at all. Um, it, it's more of saying that he is a priest in the same style or format, in the same type. So if, if Melchizedek is a type of Christ, then the order of Melchizedek would be a type of Christ's priesthood priesthood. So as Melchizedek was a type of Christ, his priesthood was a type, kind of going with the whole theme there. Um, it's not that there's this, this other, um, other order that's like transcendent. And why this is important to specify is like, for instance, the Mormons kind of get really off base about uh, the priesthood. Are we priests? Are we not? What's going on there? They have this whole like priesthood thing going on in, in their church where there's like different classes of priests and they've made this whole thing. And we're going to look at that um, probably in the future at some point. And next week we'll kind of look at what does it mean for us to be priests. But um, for this, the main point here is Jesus being a priest in the order of Melchizedek doesn't mean that there is some elite club that he's been joined into. Um, it, the, the Israelite tribes, now it, it, if you go far enough back in history, it was very common for there to be kings that also functioned as priests, king priests. Well, in Israelite history, the tribes separated them. So Judah was a tribe of kings, and uh, Levi was a tribe of priests. 
Uh, the reason for that being um, because the first two, the first son of Israel, um, fooled around with the dad's woman, so he lost his place. The next two slaughtered a whole village, and so they lost their place. And so then it went to the fourthborn, who was Judah, and that's where the kings came from. However, Levi's position was restored when um, Moses led the people out. And the people had gone into sin, and Moses said, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the tribe of Levi came to him, and so that's why they were set aside as the priests. So they kind of regained some of their um, status that they had lost from slaughtering the um, village. So there's three things here. First off, Jesus was both priest and king. Second off, uh, there is uh, the argument here that's being made is that there was warrant for Jesus' priesthood from before the law. Because here's the problem. Jesus couldn't have been a priest because he wasn't of the tribe of Levi. But what he's arguing here in verses 11 through 19 is, yes, Jesus can be a priest because he, his priest, his priesthood predates the Old Testament law. So therefore, it exists outside of it. Okay. So then the third thing, um, and this is a kind of a main point that he's trying to hit, the whole idea of Jesus being our priest is not a, at that time, modern invention. So this is now 2,000 years old. But at the time that he's writing, it's not 2,000 years old. At the time that he's writing, the Jews are saying, hey, Jesus couldn't have been a priest. And he's saying, no, 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 he could. This is not a modern invention. My example that I'm going to bring up is the order of Melchizedek, which predates your priesthood. So let's calm down with that. And so the obvious question being now, hold on, though. How does that apply? And we're going to get to that in just a second. How is it possible that the order of Melchizedek mentioned in Genesis has anything to do with Jesus? And that's where King David comes in, and we're going to hold on to that, um, because David kind of operated in a way as a priest king. He was king, but he also did a lot of religious things and oversaw a lot of the different things going on um, with different worship and whatnot. And if you remember, um, he actually ate from the bread that was in the... Um, that, the holy place. Um, it, there's a, re a resurging theme with King David that he was a priest king. So this, he's going to kind of bring that up. And so let's put a pin in that. We'll come back to that. The main idea here is that um, the basis of Jesus' priesthood proceeds before the Levites, and it stretches afterwards. So Melchizedek didn't start something that Jesus later joined. Melchizedek was a part of something separate from the Levites and before the Levites. And in that same way, Jesus didn't invent a workaround. It was in his plan the whole time. And you can go to um, no, that's, that's it. Uh, it was in his plan the whole time all along for Jesus to be a priest. I mean, it wasn't like some later invention, which is a big point because even nowadays people have this idea that Jesus um, kind of had to come up with an escape plan. Like, he wanted to save people, but they just kept messing up, so he just had to keep coming up with solutions to fix the problem. And what the author of Hebrews is saying is, no, 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 no. It was, this was the plan the whole time. The, 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 pre, the priesthood was actually just to show you something. It wasn't, think of it like a detour in the journey of faith. I mean, not, not really a detour, even. Um, a, a, scenic, a scenic route in the, in the trip of, of, of faith. So then that takes us to another question that we kind of kind of meet on the hills of this and go to the next slide there, Micah. When did Jesus actually become a priest? Uh, because, you know, if, if we're going to say that Jesus is in the order of Melchizedek, when did he become a priest? And we can kind of break that down into think manageable pieces by saying, first off, Jesus was appointed a priest from eternity. So before creation ever happened, this was part of God's plan. However, we could also say it's important to note that Jesus didn't take it. He didn't force it. He didn't grab hold and say, no, this is what I want. He was subjected to the Father's will, and it was, you know, something that he didn't force. It was something that, that, that happened. Um, so then the third thing there to mention is when Jesus actually became a priest was at the moment of his resurrection when he ascended to the right hand of the Father. And this is actually mentioned earlier uh, in Hebrews. Go to the next slide there, buddy. Um, at the end of verse 3, way back in chapter 1, he said this, After making purification, which is something that a priest does, for sins he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And he's mentioned how now we can enter into the holy place back in chapter 6. So that you can kind of put that together and say, okay, 
Jesus became a priest at his resurrection. And then the, one of the verses that we read tonight, go to the next slide there, buddy. Uh, verse 16 of chapter 7 says, Who did not become a priest based on a legal regulation about physical descent, but based on the power of an indestructible life. He became a priest. He wasn't a priest before. He became one after the indestructible life, which is after the resurrection. So, um, it's also important to note, that, to note that Jesus could not have possibly been a priest if he wasn't a man. So therefore, he couldn't have been a priest before uh, he became a man. So it kind of helps narrow it down. Uh, since priests are intercessors, God can't intercede without being man. See what I mean? He had to be both, um, fully man and fully God. So once he became fully man, he could then have the indestructible life and be resurrected and become a priest. So that takes us to the third question. This uh, kind of meets all the things that we're kind of talking about together. Why is Jesus able to be a priest? We, we've looked at the order of, order of Melchizedek. We've looked at Jesus being a priest. But now let's finally answer that question that was asked chapters ago. Go to the next slide there, buddy. Uh, how, why is Jesus able to be a priest? And there's a few different things that we can say. First off, because he was appointed by God, yes, but also because he was appointed by the same God that appointed Levi over the priesthood way back in the law. Um, also because of his indestructible life, because uh, he established a new and better priesthood. We're not tied to the same old priesthood. Therefore, Jesus can be a priest. And I think lastly we could say because Jesus' priesthood isn't based on genealogy. His priesthood, which is the new priesthood, which once again had basis before the law was given and afterwards as well, um, is not based on genealogy. So then later in this, in this chapter, he's going to say that um, it was because of his, what is, how does he say it? He says the indestructible life, and if you remember from last week, that was one of the things he said about Melchizedek. Melchizedek, it, he said, had no end of his days. He had an eternal nature. And because of that eternal nature, Jesus is also able to be a priest. So we finally have in this chapter the answer to all the questions that were raised before. But now there's going to be a lot of other questions that are raised in the Jewish mind that aren't answered yet. They're going to be answered in chapters 8, 9, and 10. Um, how in the world can a single sacrifice cover for all sin? How is that possible? And then also, how in the world are Christians under a covenant when the Jewish covenant was supposed to be forever, what's going on there? So you got all these different questions that, that, that for Jews, this is groundbreaking stuff. I mean, it's 2,000 years late for us, so it doesn't have the same, whoa, for us. <laughs> but for them, you have to kind of put yourself in, the, in, their, in, their, um, in their shoes. And this is, this is very important things that they're asking. So go to the next slide there, buddy. And so now let's look at verse 11. It says, now if perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to appear, said to be according to the order of Melchizedek and not according to the order of Aaron? So what, he, what he's saying here basically is, why in the world, if the tribe of Levi was good enough and that whole priesthood was good enough, why in the world would the Bible have told us about another priest from another priesthood? So remember, first off, that the perfect it doesn't mean the same thing in English that we're thinking of. Perfect, we're thinking of like without flaws. The context here for the word perfect is more um, reaching its intended goal. So if you are perfect in the faith, it, would, it wouldn't be that you don't make mistakes. It would be that you are maturing. You are um, going in the direction that God wants you to be in. <clears throat> so we could say there, now if perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, the law didn't produce the desired end. And the desired end was a relationship with God that we would dwell with God and he would dwell with us. But the law never produced that. The law foreshadowed something uh, better. You can go to the next slide there, buddy. Uh, the, the law foreshadowed something better. Now this is once again going to be addressed later, so just kind of put a pin in that. But the big point that he's making here in verse 11, and this is, this is really big if you, if you think about it. So let's kind of lay out, the gene, uh, lay out the history here. Way back in Genesis, we have the order of Melchizedek. In Exodus and Leviticus, we have the Levitical priesthood. And then in Psalms, which was written, the, the psalm that we're talking about was written by King David. Far after the, the, the Levites had been established, King David tells us about the order of Melchizedek. 
So this is a passage that David is writing after the law was given when there were already Levites and there was already a priesthood. So David was writing this prophetically, foretelling of a coming priest, and that priest was Jesus. So the conclusion here is obvious. The law didn't complete the mission, so it had to refer to another priest of another order that was yet to come. <coughs> another thing to note, uh, if you want to go back a slide, uh, Micah, so push up. Uh, if you note right here, it says, for on the basis of it, the people receive the law. Maybe a better translation would be... Um, for concerning it, the law was given to the people. Uh, because the idea here that it's trying to get across is um, the regulations of the priesthood came through the law. So sometimes it gets a little bit confusing how some translations um, kind of handle stuff. And then that's a good example. Um, but either way, how, however your translation reads, the, the idea is the same. Um, when you undermine one, you undermine both. To undermine the priesthood is to undermine the law, and to undermine the law is to undermine the priesthood. So this is why, if you look through the book of Hebrews, He's picking apart the priesthood, and the next thing he's going to talk about is the covenant, the law, how we're not under the same old law as the Jews, we're under a new covenant. He's going to start talking about that. And because when you take apart the priesthood, you're taking apart the law. Go ahead and go two slides down there, buddy. So down 20, yeah, there you go. Uh, verse 12 then says, For when there is a change of the priesthood, there must be a change of law as well. So the law and the priesthood are connected. Regulations of priesthood from the law. Okay, we already looked at that. Since the priest in the order of Melchizedek didn't qualify to be in the priesthood, Jesus did not qualify to be in the priesthood, so since he didn't, the law had to be changed as well as the priesthood. See, because Jesus was not qualified to be a Levitical priest. So you had to change the law to change the priest. Kind of makes sense? So when Jesus became the priest, the Old Testament law, Leviticus and Numbers, it was annulled. Moved aside. We no longer follow it. Now, this is, this is the problem, is when people hear that, they go to one of two extremes. They say, okay, so there's no reason reading it because there's nothing in there for, it to, for us today. And it's like, no, 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 no. Or they go to the other extreme and they say, well, it's the word of God, so I, I, he said it, I got to just believe it and try to do it. But that's trying to be a Jew. We don't have to try and be a Jew, and we don't have to throw it under the bus either. We can still learn from it and accept what Paul said about it, that all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for us to learn from. Yeah, absolutely, all that, without saying I have to do everything in the law. And I'm not just talking about animal sacrifices. I'm talking about the other stuff too. Um, well, once again, though, that takes us to a whole other problem because then people kind of read it and they say, I'm not going to do it just because it was in the on the, we're going to have to talk about that <laughs> at a different time because it, it's a rabbit hole, and once you start going down, you just keep going down. Uh, so let's, let's, let's come, kind of come back around here. Um, so we're going to talk about the change of the priesthood and the change of the law later uh, when it talks about the superior covenant. But, um, but the two things that he's doing here in, in these verses here is he's, he's trying to rock the, Jew, the, the foundation of the Jews their, their theological foundation, and he's also trying to kind of shake their beliefs to move them from the law to Jesus. And he's doing this by doing this. He's appealing to a time before the law with Melchizedek. That's going to rock their foundation. And then he's going to try to bring up the new, rela new realities after the law. So here it says, for when there is a change of the priesthood, there must be a change of law as well. Why is he saying that? Because he's saying this. Look, if Jesus is in the order of Melchizedek, not only was that before your law, so you can't stand on that foundation anymore, but now there must be a change of law as well. So these things that you're putting such pride in and hope in and look at me and my family and our traditions, you have to move past that as well to the new covenant. So this is going to completely be world-changing for the Jews. Let's go to the next two verses, and they're just going to kind of clarify the same things that we've already said. So just kind of pay attention to them while I read it, and if you have any questions, we'll answer them then. Uh, there, yep. For the one... For, for the one these things are spoken about belonged to a different tribe. And this is exactly what we already just said. No one from it has served at the altar. He's talking about Jesus being from Judah. Now it is evident that our Lord came from Judah, and Moses said nothing about that tribe concerning priests. So see, he's just, he's just kind of going to clarify the things that we've already covered about how Jesus couldn't have been in the, a, a, a priest because he was a, a, from Judah. So in verses 15 through 16, go to the next slide there, buddy. And this becomes clearer 
if another priest like Melchizedek appears, who did not uh, become a priest based on a legal regulation about physical descent, but based rather on the power of an indestructible life. So here we have, he's tying a couple ideas that he introduced last week from verses 1 through 10 about Melchizedek. Jesus is immortal as Melchizedek was. Now remember, Melchizedek wasn't really immortal. He was actually just a person, but it's a way of drawing a point. Um, it, we already looked at that last week. Um, so Jesus is immortal, and therefore he's qualified. Besides being appointed by God, he's qualified because he's immortal. Um, so in the same way that Melchizedek was not qualified by the legal regulations that the Levites had to be under, he was, Abraham was still subject to him way back then. Uh, and then David prophesied of the one who was coming after the law was given. So you can kind of see in these verses how he's kind of tying all these idea, ideas together. Um, and then he says here in verse 15, he says, And this becomes clearer if another priest like Melchizedek appears. Why he's saying that is because it becomes clearer because that long-waited-for pri- long priest has appeared. That's Jesus. Um, and so this argument is based on verse 17. Go to the next slide and we'll read it. For it has been testified... You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The same verse that he's brought up probably six times now. And now we can get to the last two verses. Go to the next slide there, buddy. The last two verses uh, that we started off with. But before we do that, let's kind of take, take a breath. A lot of big ideas going real fast. Any questions before we get on to verse eight, verses 18 and 19? No? Okay, so the previous command is annulled because it was weak and unprofitable. He's talking about the, um, the priesthood and the, uh, the law. So it didn't do what it was supposed to. It was weak and unprofitable. It was, it was faulty. Um, think of it like this. The law is basically a burden. It had faulty priests. It had faulty people. It had a faulty covenant, faulty sacrifices, um, and this is obviously in contrast to what he, the Hebrews author is trying to say is superior. The superior priest, Jesus, the superior covenant, covenant uh, given to us through the Holy Spirit, which we're going to look at in the coming weeks, uh, the superior sacrifice, um, a sacrifice that had to be offered only once for all sin for all time versus the sacrifices of the law, which had to be done quite regularly for all kinds of different things. Um, okay. Um, and then verse 19 kind of summarizes, not summarizes, but kind of concludes this whole idea here. Uh, And just in case you were trying to keep pace in your Bible, this theme that we're looking at, Jesus being the superior priest, is not going to end at verse 19. It goes through verse 28 or something like that. So we will not be uh, finishing this tonight. It's going to be way too long. Uh, For the law perfected nothing. But a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. So the law couldn't do what Jesus did. And a better hope was introduced to us through what Jesus did. Um, the law, here's the problem is in the Old Testament, it talks so much about the law being perfect. And then you get to the New Testament and it talks so much about the law not being perfect. And so you have like, it kind of seems like a contradiction. Of what's, what's, what's the problem? Well, the problem is more in how we're understanding what the Bible is saying, not what the Bible is saying. And that's oftentimes the case. We kind of come to our con- own conclusions, and, and then we think that if our conclusions are wrong, the Bible's wrong, and that's just not how it is. So the law is perfect in a sense, in, in a certain sense. Uh, it's perfect in that it shows us the nature of God. Perfectly. It perfectly shows us the nature of God. However, and I do want to make this absolutely clear. Go to the next slide there, buddy. The law is not a perfect utopian code. The law doesn't say how things should be. Okay, and Jesus even mentioned this. He said, from the beginning, th- there wasn't supposed to be divorce. But in the law, it was allowed. Now, if something was allowed that God had never intended, we know that it was not a perfect utopian code. Because it's not the way things should be. So that's the first idea is we go to the law thinking this is the way it was all supposed to be, and it's not. It's not. And there's a lot of things in the law that don't really apply to us anymore, but there's some things now that we do that we can take that same principle and apply it to nowadays. 
Great example of this. Um, there's this part in Leviticus where it says that you shouldn't mark your bodies. Unfortunately, somebody somewhere decided to translate that tattoo, which is not accurate, but it's fine. So then a lot of people thought to be faithful to Jesus, I have to make sure to hammer in. You cannot get a tattoo or else you're going to lose your salvation. That's not even what it's talking about. We're talking about body markings which they made on account of the dead. It was a pagan practice that they did on account of the dead. We don't have that same thing. If the, if the law was written in, in tribal Africa, it wouldn't have said about markings on your body. It probably would have said piercings on your nose and on your face because in tribal Africa, they put piercings on their face for the same reason. But way back in the ancient Near East, they didn't do that. See what I mean? So the point here that that verse is talking about where it says don't mark your bodies, do not worship the other false gods and do not get involved in the same religious sacrifices and, and, and religious traditions that they get involved with. A, a modern day equivalent would, would be, hey, um, there are atheists all around you. Don't get caught up in their way of, li of living. There are people who still sacrifice to their ancestors. Do not sacrifice to your ancestors. That would be a modern day application of do not mark your bodies. See what I mean? And even if, that, even if it was talking about ta tattoos, remember we're not under the law anymore. So there's a whole other thing there. So uh, once again, I'm trying to kind of give this a sweep by, but my main point in all this is saying the law was not a perfect utopian code of how things should be. I never even claimed to be that. The law is imperfect in that it doesn't produce the desired results. It reveals sin, yes. The law does reveal sin, at least in part, but it doesn't bring freedom from it. It just brings the knowledge of it. And Paul talks about this in Romans and Galatians, and that's just an insufficient goal. If I say, hey, you're a sinner, great. What does that mean for me? You're going to hell. Oh, fantastic. End of story. No, not the end of the story. Enter in Jesus. <laughs> There's an end to the story, and that's, that's kind of the thing here. Hey, you're not good enough. Great. Fantastic. Thanks for letting me know that. But Jesus is good enough. Oh, Okay, we're good. See what I mean? Like the, 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 there, there was a point. <laughs> there was a point to it. It wasn't the end of it. But the problem is, somewhere along the lines, the Jews got this idea. Look, we got kicked out of the promised land because we didn't follow the law close enough. Therefore, we're going to make laws to make sure that they follow these laws. So they had to follow double the laws, which Moses already had 613 laws all by himself. So we're going to add to those 613 laws and make even more laws for them. And then we'll be good enough. And then we'll never lose the promised land again. Bold strategy, Cotton. So he talks about a better hope. And we already mentioned the way in, that in Hebrews, Jesus is not the hope. Jesus is the basis for our hope. He's got, he, he opens the way so our, our hope goes into the Holy of Holies because he's opened the way. Uh, so here it talks about how the law didn't bring, didn't, didn't bring perfection, but we have a better hope. And that better hope is, is our basis for drawing near and Keep in mind that our basis for drawing near is perpetual. Jesus isn't going anywhere. Our hope isn't based on our goodness. It's not, remind, it's not based on reminders of sin from the law. It's not based on the law's inability to save us. It's based on Jesus and his forever eternal nature. Go to the next slide there, buddy. Go to the next one. Yeah, right there, good. Uh, so our hope is Jesus' eternal priesthood, his perfect sacrifice, his righteousness, through which we enter the Holy of Holies, and we can draw near because we have hope or confidence. Our hope is based on his works. It kind of all ties in there. And that really, I think, does a really good job of uh, kind of showing the overall flow of Hebrews. And if I were you, what I would do is I'd go back and read through Hebrews 1 all the way back through 719, just to kind of see the way that this all flows together. It'll, it'll really help as we move on to the next sections, because the next sections of, of Hebrews, we're kind of at a breaking point in, in Hebrews. After 7, the whole tone changes, and we start kind of launching into a whole other um, discussion. So think of it kind of like a hill. Uh, we've got the first preliminary stuff, and then we've got like the stuff about the priesthood and all that, and now we're right here. So he's, now this is the launching point of the rest of the discussions about the covenant and all that. So you're going to kind of think of it as two parts of a book, if you will. So the summary of everything we looked at, go to the next slide there, buddy, is that Jesus is, a super, is uh, our superior priest. And we're going to look at that next week too and maybe even the week after that as a very lengthy section here. 
from verses 11 through 28. Are there any questions about these? Go to the next slide there, Micah. Are any questions about any of this? You see why I started us off with those three, answering those three questions because it really kind of just summarized everything from verses 11 through 19. Um, I was trying to make it easier to uh, process what's going on here. Um, so, no questions? No? Probably because I went too fast. Uh, spend some time, you know, kind of read through it throughout the week and kind of collect your thoughts, and then you'll probably have fresh eyes in the morning and uh, give me some huge question that I have no idea what the answer is. So, <laughs> uh, okay. And next week we'll continue looking at Jesus, the superior priest. Go ahead and go to the next slide, bud. There we go. Okay. Uh, Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for this wonderful group of people. Um, I pray you'd be with us throughout the rest of our week and help us to, to learn and to grow. And uh, Lord, just help us to, to love Roswell uh, greater and to serve Roswell greater and to, uh, to love your word and to, and to draw closer to you than we have ever before in our lives. We love you, Lord. Amen.